So we're going to come into our third session on a woman who pleases the Lord. She parents God's way. And if you would turn in your Bible to Ephesians, you might say, are we going to be in Ephesians the whole time? Nope, we're not. The next two sessions we'll be out of Ephesians and into some other portions of God's Word. But we're going to look at what I think is one of the key passages on parenting, Ephesians 6, 1 to 4. I'm sure most of you would agree with me that the family is in trouble. Um, we are not living according to what God's Word says. Um, divorce is rampant, and not only is divorce rampant, but now the big thing is just don't get married. And so you just have couples living together. They decide not to get married. We have a lot of moms raising children on their own. Um, we have children that are being brought up in a totally different culture with very materialistic thinking. We're entertaining our kids to get to death. As I mentioned last night, we go, we take them from a pacifier to an iPad. Um, we don't teach our kids worth, work ethics. We don't teach our children respect for authority. Um, and a lot of things going on in the home with sexual abuse and physical abuse. And so we have all these things going on that are against us. In fact, a lot of children now are being raised in homes where they don't have a mom and a dad. They have a mom and a mom or a dad and a dad. And so how confusing is that? In fact, I even read just recently, probably some of you saw this news article, where a couple had a baby and they decided not to give it a name and not to dress it, either female or male, but to let it, the child, decide if it wanted to be a boy or a girl. I mean, this is the kind of culture we live in. The family is in trouble. <laughs> The family is in trouble. And yet, ladies, did you know the family was instituted by God before any other institution? Even before the church? And we know how important the church is to our Father. And yet, the family was instituted by Him before the church. So, what does a family look like? What should it look like? Well, Paul's going to give us a little glimpse in the first four verses of Ephesians chapter 6 as he writes concerning the parent-child relationship, and we're going to look at parenting God's way. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long upon the earth. And you fathers, you see that you provoke not your children to wrath or anger, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Now you have an outline there before you, and we're going to look at the child's twofold responsibility to their parents with a twofold blessing, and then the parent's threefold responsibility to the child. Now obviously this is not all the Word of God has to say on parenting. There are many, many Proverbs that I would encourage you to study and to look at that talk to this important topic of parenting. Paul also has something to say in Colossians about parenting. But I believe this right here is probably the classic passage on parenting. So let's look at the first responsibility of the child to the parent. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Now, listen very carefully. It's very interesting that Paul addresses children in this letter to the church at Ephesus. Why? Because this was a letter that was read, and so it must mean that there were children present in the worship service. Now, I am a big advocate of, uh, you know, I like that, you know, we have children's church and we have Sunday school, but evidently in biblical times, children were in the worship service. And so if your church is a church where the children are in your worship service, I personally believe children should learn how to sit still in church. I remember, I don't know if I've told you this story, but, you know, I was raised in a Baptist minister's home and my dad never let us leave the church service. I mean, we got our rear ends beat for that. But I remember sitting on a pew with uh, this lady that used to take me home with her every Sunday. I had to go to the bathroom so bad. But I knew that if I got up and left the worship service, I'd be in big trouble. So I just tinkled on the pew and uh, <laughs> went all over her instead. But um, I do believe that children should learn how to sit still and how to listen. We need to teach our children how to listen. I'm really proud of my daughter-in-law now. She's teaching our eight-year-old uh, grandson, Jackson, who goes to our church, on you know to listening to what Grandpa's saying and writing down words he doesn't understand. And they go home and talk about them. And so, you know, children need to listen. This is just furthers your opportunity as a mother, if they do sit in church, to then go home and talk about the sermon and what the pastor said. 
Now, since Paul is addressing children, what is the definition of a child? If the children are to obey their parents, what's the definition of a child? A child is someone who is under the care of a parent. This would not be an adult child, okay? I don't have to obey my father. I do have to honor him, but I do not have to obey him. It's an adult child. In biblical times, it would probably be someone from the uh, early elementary age to late teens, or early 20s. This is who Paul is addressing. And he says they are to obey. This is their first responsibility. Now, what does it mean to obey? Well, the Greek word means to listen under. Ladies, listen to me very carefully. Your child is to listen to what you tell them to do, and then they are to do it. <laughs> they should obey the spoken word. And I would encourage you, if you have a child that doesn't listen, encourage them to repeat to you what you just said. I know my daughter, I mean, she's 33 now, she has four children of her own, but many times I would say, Cindy, you need to go clean your room. So I'd go upstairs an hour later, Cindy, you haven't cleaned your room. What is the deal? Mom, I forgot. So she got disciplined for forgetting. So it, now that I'm older and wiser, I would, have had, I would have said before she went upstairs, Cindy, what did Mommy just tell you to do? Mommy, you just told me to clean your room. Okay, go clean your room, and if your room's not clean in you know, 45 minutes, or her room was really a disaster, it probably takes two hours, but <laughs> then Mommy will discipline you. Do you understand? Okay, and then I would follow through with what I told her to do. So some children need to repeat back to you what you have told them to do. They are to listen under. They are to obey the spoken word. Now, we have some wonderful examples of this. I think about Jesus, who became subject to his own parents. Remember when they couldn't find him? And they said, son, don't you care about us? We've been worrying about you. And he was in the temple teaching. He was 12 years old. And he obeyed them, became, came back to Nazareth with them, and was subject to them. Or I think about Isaac. <laughs> I mean, you know, his dad, Abraham, says, come on, Isaac, I'm going to offer you on the altar. I'm like, really? How many children today do you know would go do that? <laughs> come on, blessing. Mommy's going to go put you on this altar, and we're going to kill you. <laughs> And she'd go, ah, you know, <laughs> she wouldn't do it. But, I mean, what child would do that? And Isaac went, and he let his dad put him on the altar and bind him. I mean, Isaac knew that he was commanded to obey. Or I think about Jephthah's daughter. Remember Jephthah's daughter in Judges 11? Her dad went out, and he vowed to the Lord that the first thing he saw after he came back from battle that he would offer as a sacrifice, and the first thing he saw was his daughter, and his daughter said, Daddy, do to me whatever you told the Lord you'd do. Now there's some discrepancy there. Did, did he kill her? Did he really offer her as a sacrifice? Or did she, was she just a virgin the rest of her life? And I know we, there's some pros and cons on both of those views. But the point is that these children obeyed their parents. Now how many kids do you know today would say, Daddy, do with me whatever you promised to the Lord? You know, if it's put me on the altar, do that. Or if I can't be, get married, if I have to be a virgin the rest of my life, Daddy, you do whatever God told you to do. Not very many. That tells you how, you know, we've come a long way, baby, and it's not a good way. Of course, we have some examples of children that did not obey their parents, and it was disastrous. The prodigal son, he's an example. Um, Eli's sons in 1 Samuel 2, I mean, we have a lot of examples of people that did not obey their parents. And Paul goes on to say that children are to obey their parents in the Lord, which means it honors the Lord. Ladies, you know when you see a child of a Christian mom or dad and they do not obey the Lord, you know what it's like to me? It's like taking your fingernails and putting them on the chalkboard. You know, it's just like, oh. Or it's just the same thing when you see a wife who doesn't submit to her husband and she claims to be a Christian. It's like taking your fingernails and doing that on the, it's like, oh. In fact, my husband often says, Susan, a, a wife's submission is the biggest part of her sanctification. Ladies, it honors the Lord. Children should obey their parents because it honors the Lord. And he also says, for this is right. <laughs> it's the righteous thing to do. Ladies, if you are not teaching your children to obey you, to obey the spoken word, you are not training them in righteousness. Paul says, for this is right. This is the righteous thing to do. So, if you are in the habit of giving your child a command and you allow them to whine, or you allow time out, counting to three, 
coddling. If you do that again, I'll spank you. If you do that again, I'll spank you. And I've sometimes stopped, stopped discipling. I said, you know, you've told that child three times to obey you, and they haven't obeyed you. And so if you're doing any of those things, then you are not training them to obey you. And you are not training them in righteousness. Paul says they are to obey because it's right. Children should obey the spoken word, and they should do it with a joyful heart. And may I say this to you in love? How you train your child to obey you is how they will respond to their Heavenly Father. I know, because I feared my father greatly. Not because he was a, you know, he didn't beat me up or anything, but he, I obeyed the spoken word because I knew if I didn't, my dad would spank me. And uh, I, had a, I had a healthy fear of my earthly father, which helped me to have a healthy fear of my heavenly father once he saved me at the age of 30. And so you're training them in how to respond really to any authority. Their school teachers, their president, their he heavenly father, if they embrace him as Lord and Savior. Now, can you imagine what kind of world we would have if every child obeyed this command? Ah, it'd be a little bit of heaven, wouldn't it? <laughs> a lot of sorrow and grief we'd be spared, wouldn't it? Well, Paul goes on to give the second responsibility of the child. This has a twofold blessing. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. So the second responsibility of the child is to honor their parents. Now, this the command, the first command was to the child, the smaller child, this command is to all of us. Ladies, it doesn't matter what age we are, we are to honor our parents because it is one of the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the earth and that it will go well with you. Now, what does it mean to honor? If we are to honor our parents, what does it mean? It means we are to prize them, value them, revere them. Ladies, we are a far cry from this in our culture. You know what we do? Well, a lot of us kill our parents. I mean, how many kids now are killing their parents it's, and their grandparents? I mean, it's bizarre. You read about it almost every day in the paper. But what we do with our parents, which is totally foreign to the biblical world, you know in the biblical world they didn't have nursing homes and all that stuff? The parents actually lived with the family. But what we do in our culture is we put our parents in nursing homes and then the nursing home drugs them up until they fall and then they die. In fact, I know this to be true because I had a grandmother who was actually strangled in the nursing home at the age of 98. And uh, it was all over the newspapers and my mother and her siblings won a million dollar lawsuit because they actually killed her in the nursing home. And now my dad, much to my uh, disgruntled and we tried to get his wife to let my mother's dead and so he has a, a, a wife that is not my mother and we tried to get her to let daddy come live with us and she would not do that instead she put him in a nursing home even though his mental faculties and everything is fine she put him there a year ago and uh, he's in a veterans home about two hours away from me and I go try to go see him once a week but anyway um, I know because one of the doctors there actually said that it is the goal once they get the the men and the women in the veterans home even though most of the the men most of the the uh, people in my dad's place are men because they're veterans um, the goal is to drug them up enough so that they eventually fall and die and have them out in a year and when they say out they mean like in the grave and that's what they did to my dad when he first got in there my dad never took any drugs none he was you know never took drugs, they drugged him up, he started falling, and we appealed and begged, they finally took him off all drugs, and guess what, he's back to his normal self, and he's, you know, walking, and, and he's like a normal person, but that's, but everyone else I see in there is, you know, they're, they don't, they look really weird because they're drugged up. That is not honoring our parents. Honor our father and mother. Paul mentions this is the first commandment with a promise. What's the promise? Well, he's going to give the promise in the next verse, which is the twofold blessing for the child who obeys the command to honor their parents. And by the way, ladies, my husband used to often tell me when his parents were aging, he said, and they're both gone now, and he used to say, Susan, how we treat our parents now is how our children are going to treat us. And uh, so I keep asking my kids if they're going to put me in one of those places when I get old. And Charles always says, don't worry, Mom, we've worked it out. Cindy's going to take you. So uh, anyway. But there's a blessing here. He says, so it'll go well with you. You know what this means? 
You'll be happy, you'll be useful, you'll be virtuous. In fact, I think it would be an in interesting survey to see how many people dishonor their parents and to see how it fares with them. Somebody ought to take statistics of that. People that honor their parents or dishonor them. The second blessing of honoring your parents is that you will live long on the earth. You will live long on the earth. Proverbs 10, 27 says, the fear of the Lord prolongs days, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. Ecclesiastes 7, 17 says, do not be wicked, nor be foolish. Why should you die before your time? <laughs> and I think some good examples of this. Absalom, he was one that disobeyed, rebelled against his father David. Remember what happened? He was out riding around and got his hair caught in a tree. You know, his hair was very long, got caught in a tree, and he was still hanging in the tree, and Joab came by and, you know, killed him with a sword. It didn't go well with Absalom. He did not live long on the earth for his rebellion against his father. Or how about Eli's sons? Eli's sons were not only taking all the prime cuts of the meat that were supposed to be sacrificed, but they were committing adultery with women on the door of the tabernacle of the temple. And guess what? They didn't live very long. 1 Samuel 4.11 says this, The ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hopni and Panias, died. God took them early in life. Why? They dishonored their father. They dishonored them. Again, I think it would be interesting to take some statistics on those who dishonor their parents, see how long they live. Well, Paul now shifts from the role of the children to the parents to now the role of the parents to the children. There's three responsibilities of the parent to the child according to this text. Paul says, you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath. Now, the Greek word for fathers is in the plural, and it really means parents. So, mothers, you're not off the hook. In fact, I think mothers have a greater challenge because you are the ones that are with your children more than the dad. So you are more than likely more than him to provoke your kids to wrath, more than the dad. You parents do not provoke your children to wrath. That is the first responsibility of the parent to the child. In fact, Paul says something very similar in the sister epistle, Colossians. Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, lest they become discouraged. Now, what does it mean to provoke them to wrath? Well, it means to provoke them by harsh words, angry words, teasing them mercilessly, being overbearing, having unreasonable demands. In fact, because I think this is such a huge problem, I am going to give you 25 ways um, from Lou Prioli's book, The Heart of Anger, and ways in which parents provoke their children to wrath, as well as some from John MacArthur's book on parenting. So you might want to write these down. I think they're worthy of noting. The first way that children or parents provoke their kids to wrath is lack of marital harmony. Ladies, if you want to provoke your child to wrath, just be a husband and wife who fight and argue all the time. In fact, um, when our children were growing up, if my husband and I had something we needed to discuss that was tense, we waited till the kids went to bed at night or we'd go into the bedroom. And even now I've noticed with the grandchildren, um, if we have something that we need to talk about and, you know, we start getting a little more intense with each other, not that we don't argue or anything like that. In fact, that's one of the blessings now, now that I'm redeemed and I don't have this temper that I used to have. Uh, you know, we can actually talk and not get upset. But, you know, sometimes, you know, you have things you want to talk about. And I notice when, when things get a little more serious, all of a sudden the boys go, you know, what's going to happen here? <laughs> so, uh, you know, in fact, the other day, this is totally off the topic. But they were having this discussion, you know, who could, you know, who could beat up who better? And somebody said, well, who could win over grandma and grandpa? And the boys go, grandma, she could beat him up, you know? So, uh, of course, because he's been sick for a year, he's not the, in the best of health. But if you want to provoke your child to wrath, just fight all the time with your spouse. That will provoke them to anger. Number two, having a child-centered home. And what I mean by that is everything's around the child. Oh, we can't come to church today because, you know, she needs a nap. Or, oh, we won't be there because they've got a soccer match. And everything's, well, honey, what do you want for lunch? Well, honey, what do you want to do? Or, Ladies, you're the parent. They're the child. You're the parent. They're the child. In fact, my kids used to say, Mommy, why? And I said, because I said, I'm the mom. You're the child. <laughs> Number three, modeling sinful anger. If you want an angry child, be an angry mom. 
In fact, I was discipling a woman several years ago. She had a terrible temper. And I remember coming into her home and all three of her kids were just angry. And I thought, oh my. And then as I began to get to know her a little more, she, I began to notice holes in the walls. And I go, what's that? Oh, that's why I tried to throw the telephone at my husband. I'm like, really? And you know, eventually they got divorced. And I don't know what's happened to her kids. But I could tell she was an angry mother because I could see it on the kids' faces. They were angry. And that's how they handled conflict, anger. Number four, discipline them in anger. If you want an angry child, discipline them to anger. Or discipline them while you're angry. You know, sometimes what I would have to do with my kids is, you know, go to your room, I'll be there in a minute. And calm myself down so I didn't kill them, you know. Uh, in fact, my children will tell you I spanked much harder than their father because I didn't want to spank as often, and so I made it count. But, um, and even my grandsons will say, in fact, um, Josiah said the other day, he goes, Ethan, you want to obey Grandma. She spanks really hard. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. Uh, but you've got to do it not in anger. You can't beat them to a pulp. You do it with, hopefully, self-control. Number five, scolding. You want to you wanna provoke your child to wrath? Just scold them. You idiot, you know, you know just, just scolding them all the time. In fact, one time uh, when I was being discipled, still am being discipled now by two older women, but when my kids were growing up, one of the ladies that discipled me, she said, Susan, because I had a hard time loving my daughter, Cindy, because she was the rebel in the family. God saved her now, so I'm th thankful. But she said, I want you to write down every day, at least, not write down, but I want you to tell your daughter every day at least one thing you're thankful for about her. And I was like, really? Are you serious? I don't know of one thing I'm thankful for. But um, I had just been in the habit of finding everything negative about her and scolding her. And, you know, Cindy was an angry child. Probably a lot of that was my fault. Number six, being inconsistent with discipline. Today, it's not okay for you to hit your sister in the face. But tomorrow, it's okay for you to hit your sister in the face. Ladies, if you want to provoke your child to wrath, just be inconsistent with discipline. There's no standards, which is number seven, having double standards. Um, you know, you tell your child to do something, but you yourself don't do it. <laughs> In fact, I remember we, my husband and I counseled this couple many, many years ago, and we said, you want to raise little hypocrites? You're raising them because you guys are hypocrites. You're not at home what you are at church. And guess what? All three of their kids are older now and have kids of their own, and guess what? They're all hypocrites. They're all hypocrites. Don't have double standards. Number eight, being legalistic. Being legalistic will cause your child to be provoked to wrath. They can't possibly live up to those standards. If you're going to have rules in your home, they need to be governed by God's word, not because of some standard you've set up that God doesn't set up. Number nine, not admitting you're wrong and asking for forgiveness. I know this was something my husband and I patterned in our home with our children when we sinned against them we would tell them we did, and we would ask for forgiveness. Um, and so you need to be willing to humble yourself. You are not above asking your children to forgive you. Number 10, constantly finding fault. You never do anything right. Why can't you be like your sister? You want to get an angry child? Just constantly find fault. Number 11, parents reversing God-given roles. We are seeing a lot of this in our society. More and more women are going back to work. Women are, or men are staying home, being Mr. Mom. Uh, we are raising also a generation of young boys who are effeminate um, because men aren't men anymore. And so you want to get an angry child, have reversed roles. Number 12, not listening to your child, his opinion, his side of the story. Um, I know there's sometimes you can't do that, but ladies, we need to listen to our kids. Um, even if you're tired and you don't, you don't feel like it, you know, listen to them. Listen to them talk. Listen, take them seriously about stuff. I remember when Cindy was growing up, I told my husband, I said, honey, she's suicidal. He said, no, she's not. And I said, oh, yeah, she is. There's something very wrong. And after she came to know the Lord, she told us she was not only suicidal, she was doing drugs. I didn't know that part of it. 
but I knew something was wrong. I didn't take her, I knew her something was very wrong. I wasn't taking things seriously. Listen to your child. Number 13, comparing them to others. Why can't you be like so-and-so's child at church? Look at her. She plays, you know, 500 classical pieces on the piano. How come you can't do that? What's wrong with you? Why can't you be like your brother? Number 14, not taking time to just talk. Our son Charles would want to talk when I was ready to go to bed. That's when we'd find Charles plopped on our bed at night. And I was like, really? I am so tired. <laughs> but that's when Charles wanted to talk, especially as he became a senior in high school and he was getting ready to go off to master's college and seminary and, and he seemed to want to talk a lot and I wanted to go to bed. But uh, take time to talk. Number 15, not praising or encouraging your child. As I mentioned, the lady who mentored me told me she wanted me to praise Cindy every day. You know, we seem to find fault with our kids, but do we ever thank them? Good job, honey. Good job. Thanks for obeying mommy. Thanks for emptying the dishwasher. Mommy's so proud of you. And by obeying mommy, you're obeying God. Praise, encourage them. Number 16, not keeping your promises. You want to provoke your child to wrath? Don't keep your promises. We used to tell our children because we are in the ministry that when we had planned something with them, especially a family activity, we always say, if the Lord wills. <laughs> because inevitably, it became the joke on Friday night that we had family time planned, but guess what? That's when someone in our church decided to go to the hospital or whatever. We'd have those things happen, and so we usually took our kids with us, but we tried as much as possible to keep our promises. If we told our children we were going to do something, we did it. And so, unless God hindered us, and that's why we always said, the Lord willing. <laughs> Number 17, spanking in front of others. I know sometimes it's not possible to not do this, but I would encourage you not to discipline your child in front of their siblings. I think that can be embarrassing, or to cut them down in any ways, or to mention their sins in front of their brothers or sisters. Number 18, not allowing enough freedom. Now, I don't allow them too much freedom, but you know, I know some people, some parents that are so protective, their kids can't even go to the bathroom unless they ask mommy. You know, especially as they get older, ladies, you need to allow your kids some freedom in a righteous way, but some freedom. Number 19, allowing too much freedom. Okay, there's, there's a balance. When our kids started um, getting older and wanted to be with their friends, um, I'd say, where are you going to be? Who's there? Is the parents there? No, then you're not going. Mom, you're the only one. I'm not the only one, and you're not going. <laughs> Sorry, you're not going. What's gonna, what are you guys going to be doing together? And so um, they had curfews uh, in our home on Saturday night. We didn't let our kids do anything, even in their teenage years, because we believed that Sunday morning worship started on Saturday night. And so we wanted our children to be awake and alert on Sunday morning and not, you know, asleep. And so these were our rules and, you know, we enforced them and, and uh, these were some freedoms we didn't allow. But that's up to you and your husband. Number 19, or 20, mocking your child. Mocking him. Um, I've seen this, you know, little children will start crying and I'll hear the mom go, hee 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 hee. Ladies, that's not appropriate, Okay. And there's other ways that we mock our children. You will provoke that child to wrath. Number 21, physically abusing them. I do believe in discipline, but not physical abuse. Um, so I'd be very careful about overdoing that. Number 22, ridicule or name calling. Kind of goes along with mocking. Number 23, unrealistic expectations. A lot of parents want their children to be what they want them to be. Um, and so they have unrealistic expectations. Number 24, practicing favoritism. And that can be very difficult. Um, sometimes it's, it's hard not to love one child more than the other. Our daughter used to say, Mom, you guys love Charles more than me. And I would like, in my mind, like, you're right. Because he's compliant and obedient and you're not. But... Uh, <laughs> You know, it, it was hard when they were young not to practice favoritism. But ladies, that will provoke your children to wrath. Or you allow one child to have five cookies, but the only child only gets, other one gets one. I mean, unless they're being disciplined, that's showing favoritism. Now, um, John MacArthur gives just a few more, three, three more on his book that Lou Prilly doesn't mention. I thought they were good. Neglect. 
neglecting things like food, baths. I see some kids, I don't think they've had a bath in a week. And I mean, girls, I like to be clean, and I'm sure our children do too, or have their, you know, diaper changed. I, I see some women let their kids go around in dirty diapers for a couple hours. I'm like, really? So neglect, you know, food, bathe them, clothe them, uh, not attending their school functions. This is a way we neglect them, being disinterested in their life. If they have a soccer game, go to it if you can. If they have, you know, be involved. Number two, John MacArthur says, is withdrawing love. You know, not being affectionate towards them, not telling them that you love them. And then the third one he brings out is excessive discipline. Now, instead of provoking our children to wrath, notice what Paul says, we're to bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Now, what does that mean? Well, training means nurture, which entails discipline, and admonition involves words of encouragement. Ladies, this is the second and the third responsibility of the parents to the children. Um, let's take the first one, nurturing, discipline. Um, ladies, this is one way you show your children that you love them, is to discipline them. In fact, do you know that's the way that we know we belong to God? Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. And Paul goes on to say, if you're not disciplined, then you're illegitimate, you're not a son. And so if God loves me enough to spank me when I need a spanking, and I need them quite often, then we need to love our children enough to discipline them. Ladies, parenting is not hard if you'll do it God's way. It really isn't. You bring more hardships on yourself by not disciplining your child when they need it. Proverbs 22, 15 says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. Proverbs 23, 13, Do not withhold correction from your child. If you beat him with the rod, he will not die. <laughs> beat him with the rod and save his soul from hell, the proverb says. Let me tell you, I am one of seven children. We all got beat, you know, not with the rod, but with other things, some creative ways of discipline. And guess what? We're all still living. We did not die. We're all, we're all seven of us are still living. And I'm glad my father did beat us with the rod. Proverbs 29, 15, the rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. <laughs> Ladies, I don't, isn't that how you feel when you're at the grocery store or the mall and you see these kids screaming? Debbie and I have got to witness this a lot in airports. You know, we're waiting for our flight, and these kids are on leashes, and they're kicking their parents and screaming. And In fact, one of the, our most recent ones, I think we were in the Denver airport, and Debbie had gone somewhere. That was the night we spent the night in the Denver airport. And um, anyway, I hear this child, and he goes, I'm not going in that bathroom. And I'm like, ooh. And, and the mother's not doing anything. I'm like, Really? And that's what I feel like. It's not the child, it's the mother. You want to go, I, do you realize what shame this brings to you? It's not the child. A child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Ladies, the Lord, as I mentioned, loves us enough to discipline us. And so we should love our children enough to discipline them. Now, Paul mentions the third responsibility of the parent. You know, if all we did was beat him, that wouldn't be so good, would it? Then we provoke them to wrath. So we bring them up in the admonition of the Lord. This is words of encouragement. Ladies, we should encourage our children with spiritual things, training them in the things of God, teaching them biblical principles. We should do this when we sit down, when we lie down, when we walk in the way. As Deuteronomy 6.6 6 says, we should listen to them, we should pray with them, we should answer their questions, we should let them tell, them, tell us about their problems. These are all ways we can encourage our children. We must not tear them down by yelling at them, calling them unkind names. Ladies, we must encourage our children. Words of admonition. You know, there's enough children in this world that are unloved, and we as Christian mothers need to bring up our children in the word and the admonition, nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, it's interesting, Paul says, we bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord because he's already said that children are to obey their parents in the Lord, right? In other words, this honors the Lord. Just like a child who obeys and honors his parent, it honors the Lord. 
You as mothers, when you do these three things that Paul says, you know, it, you don't provoke your kids to wrath, you bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, it honors the Lord. It honors the Lord. Someone once said, most homes nowadays seem to be on three shifts. The father's on the night shift, the mother's on the day shift, and the children shift for themselves. <laughs> But ladies, Paul gives something a tad bit different for the family who belongs to the Lord. What is it? Here it is. The child's twofold responsibility with a twofold blessing, they're to obey their parents, they are to honor their parents. The twofold blessings are that it goes well with them and they will live long on the earth. The parents' threefold responsibility, they are not to provoke their children to wrath, they are to bring them up in the training of the Lord, and thirdly, they are to bring them up in the admonition or encouragement of the Lord. If you have parents that are living and you are under their authority as a child, are you obeying them? And are you doing it with a joyful heart? If you have parents that are living, whether you're young or old, are you honoring them by caring for them? Ladies, Paul makes it very clear in another place. If anyone does not provide for his own especially those for, of his own household, he is worse than an infidel. He is worse than an unbeliever and has denied the faith. Have you given over your God-given responsibility to the government or someone else? Do you genuinely look at honoring your parents as a precious gift from God? And may I remind you, how you treat your parents now is how your children will probably treat you someday. As a parent, as a mother, are you guilty of provoking your child to anger by any of the ways that we just mentioned a few minutes ago? Or maybe some ways I didn't mention. Is your child angry? Have you stopped to consider if it's because of something you're doing and not because of something they're doing? And then what about your discipline as a mother? Have you bought into the world's way of discipline? Time out, coddling, giving chances, counting to three, ignoring bad behavior, or worse, drugging your child so as not to have to deal with his childlike ways? I'm appalled at the number of kids now that are on drugs because they're ADD or ADHD. I'm like, all kids are ADD. We all are. <laughs> I mean, that's a child. We don't even let the kids be kids anymore. And what about admonition? Are you teaching your child the things of the Lord? They tell us 1% of the child's time is spent under the influence of Sunday school, 7% under the influence of public school, 92% under the influence of the home. That's a huge amount of time that you as a mom have to train your child, not only in the things of the Lord, but things like manners, which kids don't have anymore, <laughs> Caring, helping others, teaching them how to work. All the things that we've lost in our culture. In conclusion, we have a beautiful picture of the family. The children are obeying and honoring their parents, and the parents are not provoking their kids, but teaching them in the ways of the Lord, along with careful and consistent discipline. Is this a picture of your home last week? If not... What do you need to do to change so that your home will be one who honors the Lord? That your home will be one that shows others that you are a woman who pleases the Lord by parenting God's way. Father, thank you so much that you have left us instruction in your word for how we are to raise our children. And again, Lord, I ask that you forgive our nation we are not raising our children in this manner. We are murdering our children in the womb. And then the ones that we do give birth to, we are giving them up for someone else to raise while we go off to work. <laughs> and I pray that we as Christian women would see the high calling of being a mother and a wife to raise children for the glory of God, to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of Christ is such a blessing and a privilege. And so, Father, help us to get back to the high calling of women. 
especially as we think about Mother's Day tomorrow and our calling as a mother. And so, Father, help us, and even as grandmothers. Also, Lord, I pray that you will help us to know how to better honor our mother and our father. Lord, we know that also is a responsibility of not only little children, but older children as well. And so, Lord, give us grace. Again, we cannot do any of this apart from your spirit. And I thank you that he helps us. I thank you that he convicts us. <laughs> and he's the one that gives us grace to carry these things out. Bless us as we now go into a time of fellowship, of eating together and, and enjoying one another. And may our time together around food be rich. We thank you that you give us these things to enjoy. Thank you for the ability we have to enjoy food. And uh, thank you that you have created it for us. We pray these things in your name. Amen.